So rather than tell you all the things he's done, I'm just going to tell you a quick little story. Because that's what people from Belfast do. <laughs> um, my grandfather, who also lived in Belfast, was an ornery cuss. He didn't, didn't much like, like anything, anything at all. But every once in a while, he'd run into a human being that he would think was something special. And he would describe that human being as having the gift. And as a child, I always wondered what that gift was. And I really wanted it. I wanted to please my granda. So I remember gathering up all my courage and saying, Granda, what is the gift? And he looked at me as though I was from outer space and he said, child, a person who has the gift can tell you a story that is so riveting, it'll make you think about things you never even knew you didn't know. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure, based on the stories that I've heard Peter tell already, that Peter has the gift. So please welcome Peter Rollins. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. It's great to be here. Um, this is my second time in Toronto, I think, on my own. You can all hear me? Very good. Um, oh yeah, there we go. That sounds better. Uh, yeah, no, it's great to be here. Um, I'm always a bit, um, it's always strange for me, this job that I do, uh, going around and talking to people uh, about faith and life and humanity, um, because I never expected that, and it's not something I ever really thought I would kind of want to do or um, had aspirations to. Um, I just was trying to unpick the knots that were within me and, and I started to write and reflect and so, you know, just going around as I do and talking, I do have to remind myself that this is a very bizarre thing um, and uh, that I'm not really talking to you, I'm really talking to myself. You know, that's the, that's the secret of, you know, a speaker is that they, they think they're saying something wonderful to you. But really, you know, they're up here because they're insecure or whatever is going on. And, you know, they, they, I want to create lots of little Pete Rollinses. You know, that's what I want. Lots of little Pete's running around the world thinking like I do, seeing the world as I see it, because that makes me feel better. But really, really, I'm speaking to me. Uh, the theorist Lacan once said, you know, love letters always reach their destination. Uh, because in a sense, the destination is the person who writes them. You know, you write a love letter to somebody else. Uh, but you are the one who reads it and rereads it. And uh, you may not even send it. And if you do send it, it's likely the person won't even bother reading it. And, and so, in a sense, it's for you. You write out, and yet it's writing to yourself. It's similar if you've ever been in a, a prayer meeting where um, it says there's a story about a little kid, and he's with his mother and his grandmother, and he's praying beside his bed at night. And he's saying, you know, God bless mom and God bless grandmother and, you know, God bless my brothers and sisters and God, and he shouts out, and God, make sure, remember that red bicycle for Christmas, right? <laughs> and the uh, mother says to the child, you know, God isn't deaf. And the child says, I know that, but grandma is, right? <laughs> but, um, you know, and, and the, you know, we, we know that, the, you know, these group prayer meetings where you're all praying around, but really you're kind of speaking to each other, you know? Um, and, and yet, in a sense, uh, you know, speaking out, um, but speaking out something within. That's why, actually, um, I'm a big fan of prayer, and I'm not a big fan of the prayers of, you know, uh, kind of love and forgiveness and all the nice stuff. Um, maybe that's just because I'm a very dark person, but, um, you know, you don't hear in church prayers like, I pray that my enemies their children's heads will be smashed against rocks. Right? And that's actually in the Psalms, this crazy thing, you know. Um, and you can understand, because these are real enemies. This is like, you know, these, these are people who are, who are murdering, who are destroying, who are enslaving your people. So there's, there's obvious anger. But, um, and, and extreme anger. But that's the kind of thing that I think a real prayer is, in a sense. Uh, if you take the example of, you know, if you break up with somebody, and, um, you know, you come over to me and you say, oh, you know, my girlfriend, she, she went off with somebody else, you know, she, she went off behind my back and, you know, 
She's, she's no longer with me. How could she have done this? I hate her, can't stand her. She obviously hates me. She's just done this to hurt me. You know, I could say, well, no, no, don't say that. Don't say that. You know, that's, you know think of the nice things. Um, and, and you know, you know, say good things. Well, two things. One, I could just, I would, you know, then I have to repress it. But two, I could say, hold on a second. I already know that. I already know that she, she doesn't hate me. I already know that she didn't do this just because she wanted to spite me. I know that I wasn't emotionally available for that person. I know that I was always off doing other things. I know that it was, it was there largely, or a lot of it was my fault. But allow me to speak this stuff out so that I can know what I know. So that maybe one day I can meet that person on the street and I can shake their hands. I can say, I am sorry that things didn't work out right. I wish it could have been different. You know, I wish we were still together maybe sometimes. And I think of you often. But I wish you the best. And I hope life is good. But I can't get to that point until I'm able to express. Oh, thank you. <laughs> until I'm able to... Is that the, is that the vodka I ordered? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Thank you. Always, always have to have the vodka. It's the Irish in me. Um, you know, I can't, I can't get to know that. Uh, until I'm able to speak it out. Or if you imagine, say, uh, you know, uh, you know, a partner's and a woman comes home from work and she's like, oh, you know, I can't believe it. It's been such a nightmare at work. Um, you know, the people the, the next door, the, the, the office next door, they all hate me. The, the boss is out to get me. And say the husband's like, oh, no, 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 don't say that. Don't say that. You're, you know, the manager's not out to get you and the, your, your co-workers aren't out, don't hate you. She could say, this, stop it. I already know that. You're psychotic. You're, you're hearing what I'm saying and you're thinking that what I'm saying is what I'm saying. Are you an idiot? You know, I, I'm saying what I'm saying because it's not what I'm saying. I'm saying what I'm saying because that's what I need to say in order to say what I want to say. Which, by the way, we all have. If, I, if you have a relationship and you're saying, I want you to leave, we know that that often means I want you to fight to stay. Right? So if I say, I want you to leave and the person says, okay, I'm leaving, you can say, what are you doing? You know? Because... The person, by saying, by, by obeying what you're saying, is, is, is going against what you're really saying. We all know that by language. In Northern Ireland, uh, where I'm from, uh, you know, you always refuse food two times before you say yes to third. And, uh, you know, we just, this is the way it is. You just go, would you like something to eat? No, no, I really couldn't. Would you like something to eat? I'm, fat. I'm, so, I'm so full, I don't know if I can ever eat again. <laughs> would you like a sandwich? Yes, please. <laughs> And we all know it. We don't know it. It's only when I come to America and, uh, you know, because I live in the US at the moment, and I came to America and then somebody comes up to me and says, would you like something to eat? And I'm like, no, no, I really couldn't. And then they walk away. It's like, <laughs> like how rude. And I say, oh, I'm civilised. If you want to know if I'm hungry, you have to ask me three times. Of course I'm going to say no. Are you an idiot? Right? Or... And when I first moved to the U.S. and in the shops, they always they always say, you know, what was it? I always forget what it is because um, it's like, how are you doing? I think I said, hey, how are, how are you? It's like, ah, oh, well, yeah, I've had a tough day to be honest. You know, can you really talk about this? I mean, can, do you want to? Can you make me a quick cup of coffee and I can tell you about my argument with my mum? You know, we, we, I, you know, I hear that back home. If somebody says that to you, you know, they want to know how you are. But of course, everyone in America knows if someone asks, how are you? They're not asking, how are you? It would be the rudest thing ever to actually answer how you, how you are. Everyone knows that. We just don't want to know that we know it. Hmm? By the way, you see this in fundamentalism a lot. And uh, you know, this wasn't really what I want to say, but this is an, 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 an important aside. And, uh, and I'll talk more about this tomorrow. But you know, in fundamentalism, people say, well, at least fundamentalists believe what they believe. Well, at least they, they believe it, you know? I know God says it, I believe it, that settles it, right? Um, you know, they say, you know, God takes care of everything. If you have enough faith, you don't have to worry about anything. If you have enough faith, God will heal your child. If you have enough faith, you know, we're, we're safe. Nothing will happen to us. But we still put a lightning rod on top of the steeple, right? And if your child is very sick, you still call an ambulance, right? The subtle un disavowed discourse is, you know, you know, pray, pray with, with faith, complete faith, except if your child's really sick, and then go call an ambulance. This happened to me. I grew up in, in a charismatic environment where this preacher gave this talk. He was also a doctor about healing, God's healing. And at the end, it just so happened, this is a true story, guy gets up beside me, trips over, and breaks his wrist, breaks his hand. So uh, me, full of faith, you know, I 
bring the guy to one side, start praying and praying, you know. Um, and then um, somebody brings down the leader. The leader takes one look at the hand and says, get into the hospital, right? The person who doesn't believe is the minister, right? It's, and, and that's why, by the way, the liberal critique uh, of, of fundamentalism that you believe too much is impotent. Because that's the fantasy of the fundamentalist. Yes, I want to believe too much. I want to fully believe. The, the, the real critique is you don't believe anywhere near enough. You, you say you believe these things um, because they give you a psychological sense of strength. But there's a disavowed level of unbelief. And actually, you'll notice the people who, who break free of a certain form of fundamentalism um, are not the ones who don't believe enough. Uh, they're the ones who fully believe it. Fully believe it. And then it deconstructs from, 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 the, from the full incorporation of belief. That's, that's the problem with unbelief. The problem with unbelief is not that it's the opposite of belief. The problem with unbelief is unbelief is the very thing you need in order to sustain belief. So in other words, to, to sustain a level of belief, you have to have disavowed unbelief because then you don't fully confront the monstrosity of your belief. You know, like for example, all children are God's gift. Is a beautiful belief as long as it's sustained by unbelief. Because if you fully believe that belief, then, um, you know, if, if someone's raped and has, has a child, they have to have the child, because every child is a, is, a, is, a, is a beautiful gift from God or whatever. You know, I'm not saying poor, I'm just saying that this, I'm just kind of pointing out the level of this structure, is that beliefs that seem beautiful can often just be psychological beliefs we say because they make us feel good. Similar to if you see a child, you know, a little boy is crying, and you go, oh, you're such a brave soldier. Or a little girl comes out in a little princess outfit, and you go, oh, you're such a beautiful princess. Or you're having a race with a little boy, and you go, oh, look how fast you are. You know, look how strong you are, have an arm wrestle. Oh, look how strong you are. They're not. Kids are weak and rubbish and slow. <laughs> you know, brave soldiers don't cry when they've grazed their knee. And like, kids are really weak. If I can beat them in arm wrestles every time, I only, I only arm wrestle kids. I wouldn't arm wrestle someone my own age. <laughs> I'd never win. Hey, I just raise kids. You know, go have a head start. I'm still going to wipe you out, like, you know? Um, <laughs> Little girls, you're not a princess. Little princesses don't wear $5 Target dresses. You know, you got a snotty nose, you're not a princess, right? I'd be a great dad, right? But um, <laughs> the, um, the, 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 the idea is, you know, we tell these stories and they're useful. They're useful, they give you a sense of mastery, they give you a sense of power, they give you a sense of strength. They cover over your unknowing, they cover over your brokenness, they're very, very useful. In the same way, religious beliefs can do exactly the same thing. They give us a sense of strength, they give us a sense of place, they give us a sense of a feeling that everything's okay. A, a story my dad told me when I was young, uh, where he said, uh, he said there was this minister, had a big church, thousands, and every week he would preach. He was a great preacher. And um, at the very end, he would, he would often end with this heartfelt thing of, you know, what are you doing to be like Christ, what are you doing to be like God? He says, I, I'm serving the poor and the oppressed in the neighboring city. You know, every, every Sunday after church, where do I go? I go to the homeless. That's where I am. What do you do? And everybody would just, you know, wow, wow, well done. You know, be, be convicted and want to change and all of this. He told everybody, his family, friends, everybody. Now, the truth was, he was really going and playing golf. He got, he, you know, he's a minister, he's wrecked, he's done the Sunday service, he just wants to get away from the parishioners, have 18 holes, go home, right? So anyway, you know, this goes on for a while, because God's not much of a churchgoer, you know, so he doesn't hear about this, until one, at the, at, there's an AGM meeting up in heaven, and, mm, and in any other business, one of the angels says, listen, there's this minister lying to the, lying to the flock, says, he, says he's uh, serving the poor and the oppressed, when really, really he's out playing golf. You've got to do something. So God's like, yeah, okay, 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 I'll, I'll do something. So next Sunday, God dresses Sunday best, you know, shit and tie, gets, sits at the back of the church and watches. Sure enough, he's impressed. The minister is brilliant, really good. In fact, God's going like, I think, I, I think there's a God-shaped hole in my life, right? I think I should, <laughs> you know, I really, wow, you know, I really got to, I really got to move forward here, right? You know, he's really, really, really impressed, right? And, then, and of course, he does the same thing. He says, I serve the poor and the oppressed in this neighboring city. What are you doing? It's like, wow, very good. And then he gets into his wee car and he drives off, gets the golf clubs, tees up at the first hole, but this time God's there. And so minister hits it, good shot, bam, goes into the air, flies through the air, went onto the green, hole in one. 
Whoa. He goes to the second hole. This time he slices it, but it bounces off a tree. Bird catches it, drops it in the hole. <laughs> what? Third hole, boom. All 18 holes. 18 hole, bam, in one. 18 holes in one. This is like best golf game ever. Even the North Korean leaders, who supposedly had a golf game where he got a hole in one for 17 of the holes, <laughs> and then a hole in two because they didn't want to make him look perfect. <laughs> um, but so better than Kim Jong Il or whatever. So this is like, this was the game to end all games. And then God silently withdraws. And the angels are furious. They're furious. They're going like, you know, you're supposed to punish this guy for lying to everybody, and yet you gave him the perfect golf game. This is like, I mean, what, are you, what are you doing? And God, of course, says, well, maybe, but ask yourself this. Who's he going to tell? <laughs> Who's he going to tell? Right? Now, yeah that, yeah, that shows us a very deep insight, deep psychoanalytic insight. That is, what we really desire is other people's desire. The most precious thing in the world is not gold or you know, money or longevity, long life. You know, if, if, I, if, I, was, if, if I had the gift of giving you everlasting life, and I could just go around and give you everlasting life, for a fee, of course, you know. Um, <laughs> you know. But I could not help you enjoy the depth of your life. I wouldn't be a god, I'd be a devil. The worst thing you could do if I could give you eternal life without helping you actually enjoy your life. How horrible would that be, right? Um, what makes life valuable is the desire of those we desire. You see us functioning in various ways. And, and, and I'm only saying that um, briefly <laughs> to, um, I've got to keep an eye on the time as well. Oh yeah, right, that's okay. I should have, right. oh, there you go, there's a clock. All right, is that working? I've, had, I've been in places like this before where the clock has been broken and I've just gone on and on and on <laughs> forever and ever, but it seems to be working. Um, that, you know, that, that God becomes what Dietrich Bonhoeffer called the deus ex machina. This, this deus ex machina was, um, it was a kind of a, a way that really bad Greek playwrights would write their plays, where if they, if they had a problem in the script, um, they would just bring God in, say, oh, God comes in and, you know, fixes it, you know, brings, brings some back from the dead or whatever, and then they wheel the person out. And literally, they would, they would wheel somebody down in the center, like, in some child's nativity of someone's a star or something like that, they'd wheel them down, they'd do the magic, and then they'd be wheeled out. In other words, you know, God just becomes the way of us feeling good about ourselves, having a sense of mastery, having a sense of completeness, and that's it. Helps us sleep at night. Deus ex machina, God. Rather than, than, than some sort of uh, uh, texture in our lives itself. Okay. So why am I saying all that? I have no idea because we're going to have no, it's all important, but, um, but I, I, as a preamble to the main, the main show, you have to mm. ask where I'm at, By so you're going to have to keep, your, keep, keep, keep right. Um, oh yes, I was talking about talking to myself in prayer, that's how it all came about. <laughs> yes. No, I talk to myself, you talk out, you talk to yourself, you bring out your brokenness and the, oh yeah, and the disavowed knowledge and then the fundamentalism, my goodness, look at that, that's already a talk. I've made my money already, okay? Um, uh, but the question I have for tonight, and that I'm going to explore over the next few days, what's Christianity got to offer? What's it about? Um, why, why should we be interested at all? Um, you know, for me, you know, Christianity uh, has largely become um, a system of beliefs, a way of affirming things about the world. And the, oh, well, that actually connects with what I just said, gem mastery and all of that. It's an anthropology, it's a cosmology, um, it's a system, it's a tribal identity. And we hold on to that tribal identity. Um, and, and, and my argument, which I'll go into more tomorrow, is often we just hold on to that tribal identity, not because we really believe it. Um, it's because of what it does to us. That's why actually in some, con oh, see, I, I, don't worry about all the rabbit holes I go down because I bring this all together in like an orchestral hole and you'll be amazed. You'll go, I, can, I thought he was like, <laughs> I thought he was like all over the place. And then at the end, in the last five minutes, he brought it all together and I'm crying, you know? Um, it's going to, guarantee, guarantee, it's going to work. Yes, yeah, so where was the rabbit hole I was about to go down, which is an important one? Oh yeah, yeah, a sense of mastery. Oh, it's completely gone out of my head. Now, what was I just saying? Anybody? Tribal identity. Tribal identity. 
Thank you. Oh, brilliant. Very good. Very good. That's why you, you school star. Um, hey, yeah, you get a pass for the pub. Um, yeah, yeah. Note, note that down. Um, like she needs one. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's why, you know, in some, in some churches, you see that a person can't handle difference. So somebody comes, you know, where, where you, because you, the system, right, you've got the system. And it's threatened by someone who doesn't believe. So what do you do? Well, there's one of four ways you handle someone who's different, who's got weird and strange beliefs that threaten your own, you know. You either try to consume them, which means you bring them into your social body, you make them part of your social body, right? So consumption. If you can't do that, you vomit them out, get rid of the other, the monstrosity, the weirdness of the other, push them away, right? Um, or tolerate. Um, you can tolerate them. And don't talk about your weird beliefs and practices. Keep them behind closed doors and we can, we can chat and we can work together. Or a kind of a form of interfaith dialogue. We sit down together and we, we say, you know, beneath all of our differences, there is an ocean, you know, an ocean that joins us. We all are coming from the same source. Now, I hate all of those. Right? Because in all four of them, I'm right. In the first three, I'm right and you're wrong. And then the fourth, we're both right, let's have tea and biscuits, right? The, the, you know, the most interesting thing about the other, they have strange and monstrous and weird beliefs, right? And then, and then, you look at yourself through their eyes, and you realize that you're strange and monstrous, right? That's the truly frightening thing about the other. It's not that they're other, it's that they expose your otherness to yourself, right? So, the, it's not that, the, the otherness isn't the fearful thing. What's fearful is encountering my own otherness. Oh my goodness, my beliefs about marriage are weird. My beliefs about culture, my, my beliefs about how to raise children. I, I, just, I talked to somebody recently, um, I think, oh, I forget where it was, but they were working with kind of an indigenous group. And he was saying, you know, I just, I always thought that the way I brought up my kids, I never thought about it, it was just the zero level, I just did it. And then I, I worked with this completely different type of community that were bringing up their kids in a completely different way. And at first I thought it was so strange and bizarre. And then I started looking at how we were raising our children. And then I went, oh my goodness, that's strange and bizarre, right? What, that's the genuine experience of the encounter with the other, is you see yourself through their eyes. In order to see myself, I need your eyes. But in, in some communities where, where you have this set of beliefs, you, the tale that it's not really believed is whenever the, that community can't stand or have difference, has to push you out. As soon as you start asking questions, has to push you out. Is that a sign that they dis, that, 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 you know, if someone does that to me, is that a sign that they disagree with me? No. No, no, no. It's a sign that they agree with me, but they can't cope with their agreement of me, right? So take, take Rob Bell, uh, a writer who wrote a book called Love Wins. There was a segment of the evangelical community that, that really hated the book, right? Hated the book. I don't mean dislike, I mean hated it, right? So did, does that show that they disagreed with it? No. What did the Amish think of it? They disagreed with it. What did they do? Nothing. Just go about and build their barns. They don't care, right? <laughs> um, the, the fact that there was such a vehement disagreement shows that the questions that were being raised in the book are questions that were existing in a repressed or disavowed form within that community. Hence, the anger. I, last time I was in Toronto and I was talking to somebody, is it, was it Robert? You were there. Is it, is it Robert? No, Robert from now on. If I say Robert, it's just not, not, not clear. You're, you look like a Robert to me, you're a Robert to me. So Robert was there. Um, do you, were you there at the pub the night that I gave a talk after the conference? No. no. Oh, no. Oh, we missed this. I was giving this talk in this, in this bar. And this big guy at the end, big tall guy, gets up and starts swearing at me, shouting at me, pointing his finger at me, um, you, know, says, you know, just going crazy. And I was like, oh, okay. But it was near the end, so it was fine. We, just, you know, we, we ignored it. Everyone sat down, we got drinks. But I thought, I better, I want to find out who this guy is, right? So I bought a couple of drinks and brought them over and sat down with the guy. And um, within two minutes, we're chatting away. And then he's like, oh, I'm really sorry. I'm like, yeah, what's going on? He says, you know, to be honest, he says, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a talk show host, uh, a radio talk show host in, in, in Canada, actually. He says, and he says, uh, in a Christian thing, and he says, and I've recently been struggling with my faith, and I've come out with it a little bit on the radio, and I've struggled with my faith. And he said, but then you start talking about it. And I, I think I was just freaked out at myself. I was freaked out about what was going on, and that's why I shouted. 
Right, that's all right. And by the way, now we're really close friends. We're like, I've been on the show about four or five times. It's great, you know. But the disagreement, and I ha I've had this a few times, the people who ve most vehemently disagree, and I don't mean disagree, right? Disagreement's great. All my friends disagree with me. I disagree with me, right? Um, I mean, I, I had a debate with a bishop, and at the end he says, I agree with much of what Pete says, but not everything. And I thought, I know exactly how you feel. <laughs> so, yeah, um, yeah, so, you know, I disagree with me, my friends disagree with me. Disagreement's brilliant, that's what makes life fun, you know? It's, it, dis but when someone like, ah, you know, foaming at the mouth and can't stand the difference, um, that's generally, if you sit down and talk with them, it's because actually what you're bringing up is something that's within them. A, you know the story of this, this guy Seamus, for, who's, um, he's, he was, he's, he was uh, on a desert island, like totally stranded for 20 years, like shipwreck or something like that, 20 years on his own, and then his plane flies overhead and, and somebody sees there's like some dwellings and, and there's a fire and they land and they find Seamus sitting there, you know, and he's like, oh great. Um, and, uh, and they're going like, how long have you been here for? He's like, oh, 20 years, I've been here 20 years. And we'll, we'll take you home. He said, okay. He said, well, first of all, can you show us where you lived? And so he brings him to this clearing, and there's three houses. And uh, the guy says, oh, what's the first house? He says, oh, that's where I lived. You know, he says, I, I built that soon after I landed on the desert island, you know, whatever. What's the other building beside it? He says, oh, shame. He says, oh, he says, oh. He says, oh. I'm, a, I'm a very religious man. He says, that's my church. I go there every Sunday, I pray. I go there every Tuesday night, I read the good book. Oh, very good. And what's the building beside that? Seamus is like, oh, no, I don't want to talk about that. He says, oh, come on. I said, oh, no, 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 I don't want to talk about that. He says, what is it? He says, well, he says, that's a church I used to go to. Terrible place. <laughs> right? um, you know, we, uh, we, uh, we, we want to externalize, we want to externalize our own brokenness and our own internal conflicts and, 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 and tensions. And we, so we, we externalize them onto the other, right? The other becomes a scapegoat. That's another thing we're going to talk about tomorrow, the scapegoat mechanism. The other becomes a scapegoat, um, preventing us from having to look at ourselves. You know, the figure of the Jew for the fascist is that that's the problem, right? We could have like a zero-sum ideological frame for a fascist is like an organic whole community of people working together and kind of like a, a, a kind of a, an organic whole, right? So this is, the, this is the fascist fantasy. The figure of the Jew is the one who threatens that, who prevents that, who has to be got rid of. And yet, of course, it's actually the figure of the Jew that's required in order to prevent that community from encountering their own internal fissures and frictions and brokenness, right? So actually, the figure of the Jew is required. You get rid of the scapegoat mechanism, you then see yourself in your own brokenness, and there's a problem. So the very thing that's the opposition is the thing that's not the opposition, it's what causes you to not have the to not face your own brokenness. Therefore, the scapegoat is the necessary other, right? So, in other words, you need the scapegoat in order. Think of it in terms of um, the Paulinian insight uh, about grace and the law. You know, where because uh, it's structurally similar. I'll say this very briefly. Um, um, you know, a, a true psychoanalytic example, this person was sleeping around, they kept sleeping around, and they felt really guilty about it, right? So what do you do? Well, at least the guilt. The guilt, you know, if they didn't feel guilty, they'd be doing it even more, right? So they have feeling guilty. What would my parents think? What would my culture think? Whatever. And that prevents them from going out all the time and sleeping around, but still they do it. Still they do it, and yet they kind of stop themselves. Still they do it. So... You know, the guilt is there, it's the, it's, it's, the, it's the prohibition that stops them from doing this thing more. But of course, no, that's not the case. Because through the psychoanalytic process, the guilt diminishes. Don't feel guilty. Don't, why are you feeling guilty? Work through the guilt. And then you discover that it's actually the guilt that's the very thing that provides a libidinal impulse to do the thing that you don't want to do. Get rid of the desire for the guilt desire for the sleeping around disappears. What you think is the obstacle is the very thing that is not the obstacle, but it's the thing that's making you do the thing. Right? So that's the same with the fascist kind of, the, the figure of the Jew is seen as the obstacle that has to be got away, you have to get rid of, but actually is performing a function for the community who cannot face their own brokenness and otherness to themselves. Um, anyway. The, uh, the, where I'm going with all of this, oh yeah, mastery and uh, oh yeah, externalizing. Christianity, got to keep me on this on course, right? What, what's going on in Christianity? And, and, I'm, I, and I, I want to start with, with uh, Adam and Eve very quickly. Yeah, we're going to do the whole Bible. Um, I think we're going to need more pages. Because it's going to be a flip chart. I'm going to start at the beginning. Deuteronomy is very boring. 
You're going to going to have a lot of trouble getting through that one. But we do have two days, isn't there? No. Um, okay, so Adam and Eve. There we go, Adam and Eve. And, and the story is, uh, basically, they're walking around in the garden. Everything's great. They're happy. Um, everything's wonderful. And, and then we find there's this prohibition. Oh, you know, here, there's this prohibition. You cannot eat of this tree. There's a tree you can't eat of. I'm not an artist, right? But that's definitely a tree. Um, <laughs> This, they're going to, and so you've got the structure, right? You know, Adam and Eve walking around, then there's one tree they can't have, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Can't eat that, otherwise you'll die, right? What does this mean? What, I mean first, first question you have to ask when you read this story is, what makes the tree magical? Right? What, what, what's so magical about the tree? Well, any parent can tell you. It's the prohibition. You, you know, if a, if, a, if a child says, I want a transformer for Christmas, you go, no, you can't have one. It's like... I really need a transformer Christmas. I really need a transformer. And, you, know, you know, it's like, it's the prohibition. The more you say no, the more it, it creates what's called an excess of the, a surplus of desire, a jouissance, which is basically, you know, as soon as, as soon as you say, don't open that door when I leave the room, it's like, what's behind the door, right? It's the, the, the no produces the desire to transgress the no, right? This is, this is the, the very structure I was talking about with figures. The, the no, the prohibition is the thing that, that drives you forward. Um, animals don't have this. Uh, human beings seem to be the only animal with this, with this, with this structure. Um, and I kind of want to explore it, and obviously I want to kind of go into this in some depth. It's very, this is basically a, a map of what it is like for a child that grows up. When, whenever you're born, you don't have a sense of self, right? And that comes in about 6 to 18 months after the physical birth. So in a sense, there's two births. The, the, the mother's body is the womb of the physical self, and your body is the womb of the birth of your idea of yourself. And whenever selfhood comes into being, it, it, it is experienced as a sense of gap, of loss. There's a loss. What is that loss? Well, as soon as there's an inner world, there's an outer world. As soon as there's a me, there's a not me. So as soon as, like, you can't have one without the other. As soon as I go like, there is an inner world, I have an inner life, there is something that is not that inner life. So the first experience of, say, the child here, the first experience is this just broad sense of, uh, you know, kind of like, you know, a gap, a, a, a missingness, a gap which is very quickly connected to something. And the first experience of a gap is generally at the breast. The first experience of pleasure and absence and all of that happens there. And the weaning process is a strange process. The weaning process is the, is the, is the kind of the point of prohibition. You know, the weaning process, in a sense, is differentiating between mother and child. And it's really terrible. If that doesn't happen, something awful occurs. Um, you know, you, you become Irish, right? Um, <laughs> you know, um, and this is, by the way, this is why Jesus was Irish, because he lived with his mum until he was 30, right? And um, she thought he was God. Um, so you have this experience. This is the first experience of what Oscar Wilde said. There's only one thing worse than not getting what you want, and it's getting what you want. So you're caught between a rock and a hard place. You either differentiate from your mum or you know, whatever, you know, or you don't. You know, and in both ways, it's just a nightmare, right? Because... Uh, but as you grow, you can forget about that, that's the, that it, you, it makes more sense. We, we see this process more as we grow, where we often, there's something that we would like, that we focus on, something that we think would make us whole and complete. It might be making a certain amount of money, looking a certain way, marrying a certain person, divorcing a certain person, whatever it is. Something that, oh, if only I could get that, then that would be great. And there's, of course, prohibitions. There's things that stop you from getting there. And... And, and this is a kind of a human dilemma. And by the way, we're all too smart to think that really there is something that makes us happy and would, would make us whole and complete. Um, but, but that doesn't mean we don't believe it. We're often like a little boy in a, in a playground pulling a girl's hair and pushing her, right? The only, the only person who doesn't know that the little boy fancies the little girl is the little boy, right? I don't fancy her. I'm pulling her hair and pushing her, right? You know, often, often you know, we, can, we go like, uh, look at that person with all that money. I can't believe it. You know, how, how terrible they act. It's awful. It's a kind of the equivalent. You know, what we really go is like, oh, I really like that, right? You don't have it. That often the very thing we're critiquing is the very thing we want. You see this in churches, you know, with a minister standing up and going, look at the gay community out there and all the sex they're having and sex before breakfast and sex and pleasure and sex, 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 sex. And it's obvious the guys are going, look at all the fun they're having. I'm stuck in here in church, right? No, no, fun, yeah. um, you know, it's this, it's this, this excessive uh, pleasure. Um, so we kind of... 
we, we, we often, and, and it's called, Marx called it the fetish. The fetish is an object that we know is not magical, but we treat it as if it is. So we all know that having a bigger house won't make us happy. We all know that having a nicer car won't make us happy. We all know that making more money isn't worth, you know, killing ourselves for. The point is, we go out and we act as if having the bigger house will make us happy. We act as if, you know, having the money is worth kind of killing ourselves for. And that's why sermons are a weird thing, because, you know, sermons are like, oh, you know, you should be more loving to your parents, or something like that. You know, of course I know that. The point is, I just don't have to convince me. I already know it. The point is, materially, I can't embed it. I can't do it, you know? There's something, you know, and, and, and we, we, we aim at, at, at this, at, at talking on and, and our minds, when really we're talking about our hearts, our being, which is a very biblical notion, very psychoanalytic notion as well, which is um, that, in, in a sense, your, your consciousness of yourself is not who you are. That's, that's the story you tell yourself to, pr to protect you from knowing who you really are, right? So, in other words, your conscious image of yourself is a defense mechanism to prevent you from seeing yourself, right? It's, it's, and the reason is because you hang around with yourself all the time. So you've got a vested interest in making yourself look good, right? So you rationalize your behavior. This is why reality TV works, because nobody thinks they're an idiot, right? We're a story of ourselves. And so you go on the reality TV, and then you have to have a distance from yourself, and you realize you're an idiot, right? That's what spiritual you know, uh, counseling is, in a sense, is you, you, to try and get a bit of distance from yourself so that you can look at your materiality. If I want to know what you believe, I shouldn't listen to what you say. I need to look at what you do. Look at how you live your life. That's going to tell me what you believe, not what you say. My goodness, you've got a vested interest in that. It's like, that, it's like the king who goes back to the castle and says, oh, there's a beggar at the gates. There's a beggar at the gates. Get rid of him. Execute him. Do whatever you need to do. You know that I'm such a kind and compassionate passionate man that I cannot bear to look upon such suffering, right? The, the, you know, the, the, you know we, we, we live like this, you know, it's like, oh, you know, I, I love animals, um, but, but, you know, we all know there's all this cruelty in the dairy industry, but, we, you know, I don't tell me about it. There's more complaints in the UK about animal cruelty adverts than anything else, because we love animals. Don't show us what our actions do. We love animals, right? Don't show me where this is made. I love kids. Right? You know, yeah, I think kids are great. That's why we avoid sometimes watching things that we... Because the, the, the most de difficult thing, the most transformative um, knowledge is, is not the things that we don't know. It's the things that we know, but we don't know that we know. Slavoj Žižek talks about WikiLeaks. How WikiLeaks is it fascinating because people frame it as a debate about knowledge. You know, what should we know? What should be hidden? It's not, you know, it's not about that. Because, first of all, the stuff that we didn't know is boring. All the stuff we didn't know not, you know, the, the whole reason why everyone got freaked out and there were death threats and Assange is like going to hide in, in, in an embassy is because, it's because, of, because of the stuff that we all knew but didn't want to know that we knew. Black hole prisons, torture of innocents, murder of citizens, we all knew all that. That was happening. We just didn't want to know that we knew. The most radical knowledge is the knowledge that we know but we've pushed down. Um, and so when we're confronted with it, we get angry because why? We're confronted with ourselves and the stuff that we can't handle. Um, this is some stuff I'm going to go into tomorrow, but the point is, so you've got a kid, sense of absence, connects with something. This could be, and as we grow, it could be stamp collecting, it could be anything. There is a problem, I feel a sense of absence, a gap, and then there's a solution, which is this object. This, if only I had this, it would be great. In the Bridges of Madison County, if you've ever seen the film, read the book, um, Clint Eastwood is this. For the, there's, a, there's a bored housewife, she's got kids, she's got a husband, but Clint Eastwood comes into town, this really cool photographer, um, and she's like, oh, you know, I could, I could go, I could go with him, you know, there's this, this I could go, I, I could just run away from my boring suburban life and, and be with this guy. But you know what, here's the, here's the, um, the prohibitions, well, I can't be married, and what would my friends think, and, and I'd be shunned by the community, so there's this prohibition. So she's got, like, the kids and the family. These are, these are kind of substitute pleasures. They're kind of pleasurable, but they're not as pleasurable as this, the promise of Clint Eastwood, right? Um, <laughs> so she has, to she has to decide, and, and the film kind of ends with, in a sense, being unable to reconcile this problem, so her ashes are scattered by the bridges of Madison County where she met him. So she, she stayed with her husband and with her family, but in death, she was... It's like Kierkegaard and Regina, you know, in life, Kierkegaard was without Regina, but in death, he's buried beside her. Um, the prohibition. This, by the way, why is this the knowledge of the tree of good and evil? Why, how come this structure brings in good and evil? Well, the way I understand that is this excessive desire, so you just have a desire for something like kids, I'd like a puppy, I'd just like a puppy, right? And then the parents go, no, you can't have a puppy. Well then, that desire turns into what can be called drive. 
or death drive, Freud calls it. It's like, no, no, I really need a puppy. I really want a puppy. Um, and I'm going to hold my breath and pass out if you don't get me it. Or I'm going, to, you know, I'm going to make your life a living hell until I get the puppy. Right? What happens with excessive jouissance is a form of morality enters that is kind of absent from the rest of the animal world. You know, which kills and all of that stuff without, without this excessive pleasure and without this excessive jealousy and resentment. It's a weird thing. So only humans are really the ones who kind of torture and, and all that. So what happens is you have this, and this is, this is what can be called the zombie drive. So this is a bit interesting. You, you watch a zombie film. Zombies are very selfless beings. Because if you put a shotgun in front of a zombie, it still comes at you. It doesn't stop. You put a shotgun, just comes at you. Stop, no. Or the alien, the aliens. This is a completely selfless act, but it's a selfless act that's profoundly destructive. And that's what Freud called the death drive, the zombie drive. And, and if you see The Walking Dead, The Walking Dead is kind of, in a sense, a non obscurantist zombie show. Because most zombie shows is like, you know, the zombies are out there, and then if they bite you, you become a zombie, right? So the zombie virus is external to us, and then we get bitten, and then we become a zombie. But in Walking Dead, the truth is, we already are the zombies, right? The, zombies were, the zombie apocalypse isn't coming, it's already here. We are the zombies, and when you die, you fully become one. That's more true to the human experience, that there is something within us that, that obsessively connects with things. That's why psychoanalysis, why do I keep going out with people who hurt me? Why do I keep, you know, these are psychoanalytic issues. There was an experiment done where they put mice in a cage and behind a glass sheet, like just like this. So these are the mice, behind a glass sheet they had really good food and then really easily accessible they had really rubbish food. The mice bounced their heads against the glass to get the good food, couldn't get it so they ate the rubbish food. Right? The perf perfect utilitarians. They hadn't read Bentham or Mill, but they, they knew it already, you know? <laughs> They're doing their, their pleasure calculus. And, but then they took the mice out, they played with their brains, they stuck them back in, and what happened? Then the mice started bouncing against the glass, and they didn't renounce it until they died. Right? They created little zombies, zombie mice, or little humans. Because... <laughs> cause, cause, and, and this, by the way, is why Ayn Rand's critique or you know justification of a form of frenetic consumerism is incorrect where it's like oh well it's just selfishness you know this 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 uh, kind of market capitalism works on a uh, implicit selfishness within us that that, that take away morality it just we, we selflessly go after what we want we pursue what gives us the maximized pleasure and let's try and make it work for all the the for the Freudian insight is no 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 it works because of of a profound selflessness but not a good selflessness, a zombie selflessness. If you meet very successful people, often, you know, if they were selfish, they would stop. After they'd made 10 million or 20 million, they'd go and have a laugh, right? They're one of the best footballers in the world, this guy called George Best, he's from Belfast. And he was once asked, you know, uh, you know where did all your money go? Because he has loads of money. And he said, oh, well, he said, I spent it on, on women and drugs, and I squandered the rest, right? Now, um, <laughs> this is... This is what happens, it's, it's, you know, the, the, this person works themselves to death and then it's the kids go out and they squander, have a laugh and buy all the fast cars, right? But this person works themselves to the early grade or someone's pursuing fame, 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 fame and they can't stop, they can't stop. You know, and they, every time they, they get what they want, they realise it's not what they want, it doesn't satisfy and so they have to go, oh, maybe it's the next album that I make, maybe it's the next thing. So we're, we're all like, now here's the human predicament in simple forms, we're all like Roadrunner, right? Uh, Wiley Coyote, sorry, not Roadrunner, we're like Wiley Coyote, because we're all chasing after something, right? Chasing after something, and the problem is, what would happen if we ever caught it? What would happen if Wiley Coyote ever caught the Roadrunner? You know, is it what? Like, a family guy has this, actually, it happens where the bird dies and he's eating it, and he's going, oh, when you've worked for your food, I mean, really worked for it, it just tastes that much better. And his friend says, what are you going to do now? Oh, I haven't, I haven't, I don't know, I haven't trained for anything else. I'm sure something will come up. And then it cuts to him kind of watching daytime TV and drinking. And then he gets a job in Wendy's and finally tries to kill himself with his catapult. And, but, you know, the, the point is, and I, and I have to say, it's better, and I, I can't go into this in great detail, but the, the, the thing about, the thing about uh, Roadrunner, if you ever watch it, um, there's, a, there's a problem. When you watch it, there's a problem. And it simply is, right, how fast does a coyote run, right? I'll tell you what, it runs three times faster than a roadrunner, right? Why can you not catch it? Coyotes run three times faster than, road, than, than roadrunners, it's true, it's true. And also, not only that,